tonight we're going to be all over the place. We're going to be a little schizophrenic in our Bible, uh, all over the place, multiple personality. If you want to uh, open up to Isaiah 46, put your finger there. We're going, to, it's going to, we're going to get there. But Isaiah 46, verse 10, and then we'll start there. And uh, let's pray, shall we? Dear Father, we just come before you right now. We just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for you. We thank you for the cross. We ask that right now that you would speak to our heart like, like we just need you, Lord. Fill us with your spirit so that we can learn these important things from the Bible and that we may grow in you. And so, Lord, bless tonight. Forgive us for any sin. Wash us and cleanse us, Lord. We want to be clean before your throne. And just bless tonight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I am a product of, um, I'm a pastor's kid. My dad was a pastor for Calvary Chapel, Long Beach. He started it. I was the first member. Um, I was the first deacon. I was the first elder. I did everything at the church, man. Dad put me to work. He says, this is the family business, Andrew. I'm like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Godfather. And it was, it, was, it was just how it was in our house. Our first service was at Calvary Chapel, Long Beach, was uh, at, at somebody's home. We, went to, we were at the beach, and we had to move the furniture at the house. It was just part of life. But my parents put in me a love for God's word. I mean, I did not get your run-in-the-mill stories. I, 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 you know, they read Jack and the Beanstalk, Mickey Mouse, but it was the Bible. And they hid nothing from me. When I was a kid, I loved the Bible stories. Tell me another one. Tell me another one, Dad. I want the word. I want that. I want to hear it. Tell me about this. And I grew on that simplicity of the scriptures. I remember taking some people play G.I. Joe. Um, my G.I. Joes were not just G.I. Joes. They were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and the lion's den. I lost more G.I. Joes to that fiery furnace. The fourth man did not show up for them. God bless him. There was limits to the story. But it's true. I, I was a kid who was in the world. My mind was always there. My, I remember at, at around four or five years old, my dad would act like he was Goliath, and I'd get to throw rocks at his head. And he let me. He let me. He would try to catch him before they smacked him on his head. But he'd fall down. And he'd go, go get your sword. Go get, this, go get my sword. Chop off my head. Chop it off. <laughs> it's four years old. You know, over at Stearns Park in Long Beach, you see this kid hacking away at his dad's head. Like, what church did that kid go to? You know, my goodness. Drama. My dad and mom hid nothing. They let the word speak for itself. And when I got to the book of Judges, the bloodier the better. Man verses. I call them man verses. It's like, oh, JL taking that tit peg and nailing that guy through the temple, sticking him to the ground. Wow. Talk about woman empowerment, jeez. That was just so cool. The, 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 the Samson ripping a lion into two from the jaw. Oh, and I just lived it out, the word. But I will tell you, I love the New Testament, but my favorite was the Old Testament. I was more into the Old Testament than any other time. I love that. I loved it. The Old Testament was my place. I loved it. I loved the Hebrewness of it, the Jewishness, God's presence amongst his people. It fascinated me. When I was a kid, it was the Old Testament that drew me closer to the Lord than anything. But I will tell you this. As I became the pastor at Calvary Chapel Long Beach when my dad went home to be with the Lord, in my younger years as his associate, I started to notice something in the body of Christ as a whole, mainline Christianity, where there was a rejecting of Old Testament. There has been a, something in our culture, in our church culture, mainline, mainstream, which I really believe that we need to be not mainstream. We just need to be Holy Spirit led, and that makes us all go where He's going, you know? But false teaching that God has changed from Old Testament to New Testament. Oh, that's the Old Testament God. Have you ever heard that before? Oh, I, I'm, I'm more of a fan of the New Testament Jesus or the New Testament God. And, not that Old Testament guy, you know, blood and guts, fire and brimstone. Oh, that's a harsh God. The Old Testament God isn't loving. I like the loving God of the New Testament. 
This has happened. God, I heard this also in their culture. God is done with the Old Testament. Oh, he's just done with it. It's, that's why it's old. It's put it out on the curb. Put it out the, for the garage sale, dude. It's old. No need to study it at all. I mean, come on. Do we really need to study Deuteronomy? Ugh. Come on. Get with the program. Deuteronomy? Leviticus? What is this, a carniceria? You know, what, what is up? You know, come on. The Psalms are okay. They're kind of nice. <laughs> you know, they make you feel good. Good little butterflies, you know. Psalms are okay. Oh, and the Bible stories for the kids. We've got to have a Sunday school. What else are we going to tell them? Barney? No. <laughs> Baby shark? No. But all those teachings that we just talked about in mainline Christianity are just demonic. They're not from the Lord. They're not complete. They're not true. We call it the Old Testament because it was written first. It was, it's older than, than the New Covenant is, or the New Testament. It, it, it's about a time thing. But it's the same story. It's the same thing. There's no difference. There's no lack of vigor. There's no lack of effectiveness. It is vigorous. It's more alive than everything. Have you read the Old Testament lately? Well, you know, I like Samuel. I'll do Genesis, Exodus. I'll skip Leviticus dabble in numbers, skip Deuteronomy because it's just a repeat, come on. And then I'll do Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, Kings, Chronicles, Pfft, I've already been there. You know, then, uh, you know, Ezra's good, Nehemiah's good, Psalms is okay, Proverbs is fine, but then you hit Isaiah? It has some stories in it, but you know, it seems like he has some problems with his neighbors, he's not really inclusive and diversive. You know, he really doesn't like those Moabites. And then they just kind of go off on people, you know. Oh, the prophets are so hard. Is it really there? And it, a lot of people have a problem with it. It does. But everything about it, there's nothing old about the Old Testament. The Jews call it, in their teachings back in the day, the Mikra. Mikra means the reading or the, that which is to be read, the Mikra. That's the ancient name for the whole, what we call the Old Testament. And trust me, you want to get into a little contest with a, a, a Jewish friend, call it Old Testament in front of them. They're like, excuse me, it's not old. They don't put the old on there. We did. Somebody did. I wasn't me. But it's Mikra, the readings. But now they have a more modern, well, modern to the Jewish people. It's it, during the medieval days. <laughs> during the medieval days, they had a new name, an, an, an acronym. Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, which means the law, Torah, Nevi'im, the prophets, and Ketuvim, the writings, which is, includes the, uh, the uh, poetries and the histories. Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, T, N, K is a word that they like to use, Tanakh. T, N, K, Tanakh. That's what they call, what we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh. It's an acronym. Torah, prophet, or the law, prophets, and the writings. The Torah is in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Glorious Genesis. Glorious Exodus. Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. It, it tells you everything. Genesis is the basics. It tells you about creation. It's great stories. Noah, Abraham, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then Joseph. It's a, it's a book of biographies. Then Exodus comes along, and Moses. And if you want to read Moses, you also could watch the movie, and you have Charlton Heston. <laughs> Praise God for Charlton Heston. And you have those movies. Leviticus, now that's where everybody creeps out. Like, sorry, I'm not watching a, a butcher show. What is this? Oh, the symbolisms. The, the concepts of atonement and blood offering and covering for sin. Numbers. Numbers, the stories that are there, the, the, the progress, the failures of the Jewish people in the, in the wilderness. Deuteronomy, just so that you want to make sure you don't miss it. We're going to do it again. And we're going to retell the law. The law. Oh, I don't like the law, Pastor Andrew. The Old Testament has the law. Oh, that's so hard. Oh, it's so boring. Really? 
<laughs> the law, guys, is awesome. There's three parts to the law. First part is moral law. Those famous ten. The Ten Commandments, right? You know them, hopefully. And you see those ten. That's the moral law. Everybody's ruled by them. That's the ones we break. Break one, we lose it all. And then you have another part of the law, ceremonial laws. Pictures of what Jesus is all about. Christian issues pointing to Jesus Christ. The ceremonial law. How to bathe. How to do rituals. How to do holidays. And then you also have the third part of the law, civil law. Crime and punishment. If your cow beats another guy up, what happens to the cow? I wonder. And it's just civil law. Now, we don't live by the ceremonial. We ain't got a tabernacle in our backyards, right, guys? We don't have a temple. We do, if you have an altar in your backyard, Justin will talk to you after service. We don't, we don't do sacrifices like that. So we, there's no ceremonial law. We don't wash the way they washed. And there's no civil law. We're Californians. We barely have a law. But it's just like, so I'm just joking. But it just, it just says how it is. And we have all these things and we have, we have our own civil law. We're not underneath the ceremonial. Civil, there are lessons for us. Pictures, lessons, spiritual depth, moral law we're under. That core law. And it goes into the history books. These characters, David, Daniel, Joshua, the judges. Oh, guys. You know how Paul said that the Christians are living epistles? That we are letters that people read as we walk down the streets? Remember that? Well, you know what the original living epistles were? Joshua, Moses, David. Gideon, those guys. You look at their life and they go, man, look at that life. And there are lessons that they give us that you'll never get anywhere else. Lessons that are powerful and potent. The poetries, worship, the first worship leaders. Tenderness and wisdom. And prophecies, we'll get into that in a little bit. Major and minor. Minor prophets, they're not minor because they are less important. They're minor because they're smaller. People get upset. Oh, they're so long. Jeremiah's huge, Ezekiel and Isaiah. I don't have time for all that. Yeah, we do. It's God's word. It's awesome. So tonight we're going to just cover why is it important? Why is the Old Testament so important? Number one, if you want to get down to it, the prophecies. Oh, guys, the prophecies are so cool. Uh, Isaiah 46, you're all, uh, are you there? Are you there? Because I'm not. <laughs> I'm a horrible pastor. Isaiah 46. Look what it says. Verse 10. It says, declaring the end from the beginning. God is talking about his word. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saving, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. He declares it from the end of the beginning. The full counsel, he's going to do it. He's going to, I'm declaring it for the future. Prophecy. If you didn't have prophecy, which, now let me say, the Bible has, out of all the religious books in the world, the most prophecies in any religious book. But this is the cool thing. It's the most prophetic and the most accurate. Historians have had a classic problem with biblical prophecy because it's so doggone accurate. If you look at the book of Daniel, Daniel is so, you guys are going through it right now, right? It's so accurate in its prophecies that they say, well, there's a couple Daniels. There's around five different Daniels, they'll say, modern scholars, trying to explain away the accuracy of it. And then they'll say this, oh, well, there's a couple Isaiahs too. Because he's so accurate. Because all his prophecies that, he, that God gave him and spoke forth came to pass. History shows the accuracy. When someone, a prophecy is spoken, archaeologists, history tells us it's truth. There are prophecies about nations, armies, peoples, and cities, and kings, and governments. And this is the thing. If those Old Testament prophecies about those cats were right, then the prophecies that they have about the coming of Jesus Christ are going to be right too. 
if it already is making 100% on the test, it's going to make 100% on the other parts too. It proves itself to be faithful. These prophecies speak forth God's word, but also are predictive. History, they predict history. We talked about that. These prophecies also talk about Messiah. The first and second comings. Speaking of the millennium and end times, if it's been accurate, it will stay accurate. That's just prophecy. And you get that in the Old Testament. The two major topics of biblical prophecy are this. Number one, Israel and the kingdom of Israel. And number two, the Messiah. Those are, everything goes around those two topics in Bible prophecy. So why is it important? The prophecies. We ditch them because they're long. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. Oh, what is he saying? Dry bones in 38 of Ezekiel? What is that trip? Did he eat some like peyote? What is going on? Crud, that's gnarly. No, it's, it's God is speaking through visions. Watch. God just will pro prove himself to be true in prophecy. Why is this so important also? Number two, it's our traditions. If you're taking notes today, guys, it's our traditions. Everything we do as Christians in our culture, in our uh, rituals, is Jewish. Not one of them. Everybody's like, well, maybe it's Roman. Uh, it's, it's Latin. No, it's not. Communion. Oh, that that's, that's comes from the Catholic Church. It's our roots. and our, our for No. It's Passover. It's the third cup of Passover in the Afik Holman. If you're Jewish, you know what that is. It's a certain type of bread. It's a certain type of cup. It's the third cup it's the that symbolizes the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. And you see that there, it's a Jewish practice that we practice as the church because the church is, oh, I'm going to shock somebody. We're not Judaism, but we are Jewish. It's our roots. We were born in that. It's our cradle. It's the Jewish world. Communion. Worship. What we see up here was a beautiful time of worship, right, guys? Where did this come from? It came from the temple, from the tabernacle. L look at what Solomon did, the first worship teams. If you want to get back to the first hardcore worship team, it was a one-man band with a harp in a shepherd's field named David. And he was out there going, man, I'm digging this, worshiping the Lord. And it even goes back farther than that. But the worship, it's a Jewish concept. Baptism, oh, that's all, oh, that's not Jewish, that's not Jewish called the mikvah that it's all over the place it's totally jewish where do we get that idea not from the germans you know it's from the jews the idea of bible teaching no i would rather pagan society didn't do it like the like teaching where, like, where do you get the teaching from we got it from the jews that was the Remember what Jesus says, come let, us, come, let us reason together, says the Lord in Isaiah chapter 1. Though your sins may be as scarlet, they may be white as snow. There's a, there's a teaching, leadership, leadership in the church. You can put, it's Jewish. Even baby dedications. When you get a build baby, you dedicate a baby into the Lord. What's that concept come from? That comes from Judaism, from the Jewish worldview. Our traditional roots are in the Old Testament. Next, number three, why is the Old Testament so important? It's the first part of the whole story. The Bible is whole. Even though we have two covenants, it's one book. It is fascinating. The Bible is a whole. There are not different, oh, the Old Testament, that's just crazy stuff. New Testament's more lovey-dovey. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. It's the same, it's the continuation. It's the same thing. If you kick out the Old Testament, you're not going to know what's going on in the New Testament. The greatest commentary on the New Testament is the Old Testament. It's the best one. So it's the first part of the whole story. Number four, also, here's the next point. The Old Testament reveals the nature and the character of God better than anything. Je you're like, well, what about Jesus? True. But read the Old Testament. And you will see God in all of his glory like you've never seen him before. In Exodus, turn in your Bibles. Exodus chapter 34. In Exodus 34, 
God just gave the law, He's giving the law. In Exodus 34, verse 6, it says this in Exodus 34, verse 6, And the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed. Now you know what's going on. The Lord was telling Moses, is, uh, the people are blowing it. God is really not hanging out with the Jewish people. They're having a problem. And then all of a sudden, the Lord is talking about his grace in, in chapter 33. Moses just can't take it anymore. He is talking to God and he says, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory, O oh God. And God says, I can't, you'll melt. This is paraphrased. Watch Indiana Jones. You know, just joking. He says, but I will do something. See that crack in the rock? Stick your head in the crack. Stick your whole body in that crack of the rock. And I'll pass by, cover you with my hand, I'll pass by, and you can see the shining, the afterglow of my body. You can see that. And as God passes by in chapter 34, verse 6, and it says, Then the Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed. This is what he proclaims. Listen. Talk about, and this is just a taste of what the Old Testament gives you about who God is. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, still justice, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation talking about justice for sin look at what it says about god did you catch that how thick is that and after god says this after he passed by and after god sees the radiance of his glory it says that moses's face shined glowed keeping mercy for thousands Forgiving iniquity, transgressions, and sin. Abounding in goodness and truth. Man, that's the Lord. That's who he is. That's who he is for us. That's, who, that's his nature. He's loving and his justice. And you see that in the Old Testament. One of the greatest things that you can do in the New Testament, if you really want to get to know God, start learning the names of God. Holy mackerel. Start learning the names of God, those beautiful names of God, like El Shaddai, El Elyon. Oh, the Jewish names of God give you a deeper sense of who God is. God is not silent in the Old Testament. We need the Old Testament. We need to be students of the Old Testament. Number five, why is the Old Testament so important? It's characters. It's characters are teachers. David's a teacher. Story time never gets old in the Old Testament. David, Daniel, Joseph, Nehemiah, Ezra. Even the bad guys teach lessons. And it's so good, the judges. And you know what that's so and you know what how it is? If you want to, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us about these characters. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 through 10 says this. Now these things became our examples talking about the Old Testament stories. These things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And don't, be, don't become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people who sat down to eat and drink and rose up early to play, Exodus 32, 6. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 20,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor complain as some of they also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. All these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Wow! Guys, the Old Testament Bible stories are our examples on how to live. They are our teachers. It reflects 
It's a reflection of, their, of the worst a Christian can be or worst a believer can be or worst a follower of God can be or and also the best as one could be. And not just the, and this is the thing, it's not just the characters. It's also the places. Yeah, we're going to Israel. And if you want to come, dude, it is great. It's going to be my 13th trip. And I love Israel. My first six trips were with Pastor Chuck. And my last were with Dad. And I was helping him run the trip. I was the money guy paying off everybody on the trip. And fun job. But this is the thing. When you're on Israel, you get to a place. And, and in the Old Testament, you get to an Old Testament site. And the place speaks to you. And even the Bible says that. In Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 12 through 15, there's a passage where God is saying to the nation of Israel, you want to look, you want a lesson, you want to see what happens to a person that totally falls away from me? Go see the city of Shiloh. Go up to Shiloh. It's desolate. The tabernacle was there. Great things of God happened at Shiloh. But now it's totally desolate because it walked away from me. And you'll be that way if you walk away from me. You'll be desolate as well. That's the thing, guys. Even the places teach us things in the Old Testament. You look at it. You, like, if you go to Israel, you'll hear this. When we go to the Valley of Elah, where David fought Goliath, it says that David fought Goliath, and the Philistines came as far as Ephes Demim. And they went to a place called, uh, the, the area is called Ephes Demim, and they went no farther. And they went to the Valley of Elah. And you say, oh, okay, this is Ephes Demim, this is the Valley of Elah. And the Philistines only came this far. The place speaks to you. Well, what do you mean? Translate the names. Ephes Demim means blood drops. Elah means strong tree. And the enemy can only go as far as where the strong tree is and the blood drops. The cross of Jesus Christ. They can't go any farther. And that's the Valley of Elah. The enemy was stopped right there. That's the beauty of God's word. Even the names of the cities mean something. And that's the power of the Old Testament, of God through the Old Testament. It's a beautiful place. It teaches us. Number six, it's divinely inspired. Turn over to 2 Timothy. I love this. There are some people that say, ah, you know, why are we in Daniel? Why are we in Leviticus? I was a youth pastor for years. 20 years I was doing youth pastor work, and I loved every minute of it. And you know, with kids, you just got to take it up a notch sometimes. And we were going through Leviticus, and we decided to, Let's do some sacrificing in my backyard. <laughs> so that night we had the whole youth group over into the backyard. I got my Weber grill out. I went to the carniceria that morning. I got intestines, liver, kidneys, fat, skin, as much skin as I could. And I, I had blood. I had a nice quarter blood right there. And I come walking in, it's all under a blanket and meat, a, like a leg of something, I don't know what it was. <laughs> Wasn't pork, I know that, it was not pork. <laughs> and I kept on asking the guy, I said, no chorizo. No, I, was like, I, I don't know Spanish, so I'm like, I thought chorizo meant pork, but it doesn't. So I'm like, no pork, you know pork? And he was like, eh. I said, pig, oink, oink, you know, her. You know, he goes, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I'm like, I got all this stuff. And I'm trying, it's like, intestines, you know, <laughs> you know, intestines. <laughs> oh, you know, it was a great day. <laughs> Bring it back, lay it all out under the sheet. Kids are there, and they're like, oh, it's a fire pit. How sweet. Where's the worship leader? Let's sing. And I said, okay, guys, we're going we're gonna to get rid of some sin, Old Testament stuff. How many people sin? They're like, Whoa. how many people sin today? Okay. And I brought out. I said, I don't have a sheep. So I brought out my dog. <laughs> I said, okay, you, you look like you sin a lot. Come here. <laughs> I said, lay your hands on this dog. What did you, oh, I lied today. Say it. Say, I'm a liar. I'm a liar. And I took out a butcher knife, put it underneath the dog's neck. I said, now say it. 
confess it to God. And as you confess, I'm going to cut this dog's throat. And your sin is going to be put on this dog, and it's going to die for you. And everybody's like, really? I said, yes. And I just acted like I cut it, but it was a fake knife. And I'm just like, and the dog's like, you know, poor chihuahua. I said, that's how it's done. And so I pulled it. I said, and then it cuts it all up. And I started to place it going through a sin offering. Where do we put the intestines, guys? And by the, I'm covered in blood in this white shirt. I, had, I made sure I wore a white beat-up shirt and shorts. And there's blood splatter everywhere. And I'm it's like, I said, you take you. But where do we put the blood? On the north side of the altar. And they're like, it was just a mess. And I said, now, turn to Hebrews. I can't do it. I'm covered in blood. Someone turn to <laughs> Hebrews. What does it say? That Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ, is better than the blood of bulls and goats. And I said, he did it. He did it with his own life, his own body. And it was so fun. And they'll never forget it. <laughs> now they have their own kids. Then they come up and say, I remember Leviticus. That's Leviticus. That's Leviticus, guys. It's like, oh, it's so boring. No, it's not. You just got to get it. Get into it. It's so important, divinely inspired. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Speaking of the word of God, Paul is talking about the Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And everybody's like, going, oh, that's the New Testament. Did Paul have the New Testament completed? Was it done yet? No. So what scripture is he talking about? The Tanakh. He's talking about the Old Testament here, guys. So he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. That means it's worth something. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, you might be saying, well, those are big words, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction. What does that mean? Let's break it down. Paul says that the word of God, especially the Old Testament, which includes the New Testament, the Bible, the, our, our full Tanakh. Doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction. That means the Old Testament, Testament is profitable. It's worth something. It's divinely inspired for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. Let's put it this way. Doctrine tells us, what is right. Reproof tells us what's not right. Correction tells us how to get right. And instruction tells us how to stay right. That's what the word of God does. And specifically, if you want to get in context, oh, the Old Testament. The whole Bible does, amen? But especially that old, the Old Testament. It tells us what is right, what's not right, how to get right, how to stay right. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, so that you can be equipped. It equips us. Latin, next point, the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. Turn over to Colossians chapter 2. Oh, these Colossians. There's a lot of problems in Colossae. It was a city under siege. Those poor Colossians. They're in the Lycian Valley. Coloss the city of Colossae was up against the hills a little bit. Over to there, you see the city of Laodicea. They're all jacked up. They're all like lukewarm. They're like, you know, if you go to Laodicea, even today, and you turn on the faucet at the hotels in Laodicea, guess what you're going to find out? Their water is lukewarm, just like they were, because it's thermal heated. Every, it's weird, because I was like, turn on the cold. I'm like, I'm in this hotel room. I'm like, Turned on the hot, it wasn't hot. It was all lukewarm. I was like, how cool is God's word? They're still lukewarm. <laughs> we went to the, we went to the archaeological, uh, archaeological sites, and they were, had piping that brought down fresh water, and they were calcified, which shows. And the guy says, I said, what is this on the thing? He goes, oh, they're calcified. I said, what does that mean? He goes, that means their water supply was lukewarm. <laughs> Shut up. And Jesus says, you're spiritually lukewarm. And Laodicea is like, no, our water supply is. No, no, you are. You're neither cold nor hot. 
But here it is, Colossae. They're up against the wall, literally up against the hills, the mountain range. Laodicea is over there. Heropolis is over there. Both are struggling with these crazy doctrines that are trying to infiltrate from those cities and their bigger cities crazy doctrines of pagan worship and angel worship. And Paul is hearing from this, and his, these guys come over, uh, Onesimus, and uh, sorry, Philemon comes over, and uh, he's there, and he goes, and, and, and he's one of the elders of the church, and then another guy comes over, uh, and, and they're talking to Paul, and, and he says, Paul, what do we do? He says, I'm going to write a letter. I'm going to write a letter. He writes Colossians. And they, one, of their pagan, one of their weird philosophies was Judaism, and it was a mixture of Judaism with paganism. And they said, hey, if you're going to be a real Christian, you're going to be Jewish. You're going to keep to the law. It's Jesus plus circumcision. Wouldn't that be horrible? Wouldn't that, be, that would just really make Harvest Crusades interesting, wouldn't it? <laughs> Greg Laurie's up there saying, now come forward, say the prayer, say the prayer. Hey, welcome to the family of God. Almost. As you can see, the medical tent's over there for you men. If you really want to be saved, you receive Jesus Christ. Well, you're not done, gentlemen. You have to go over and make sure that you're circumcised. Wouldn't that be horrible? That was what they were dealing with in the early church. Jewish people that said, you're not really saved. Are you circumcised? If you are, you're good. If you're not, you better go see a doctor right now. Oh, or a rabbi. And let him do it. Not even a doctor, a rabbi. Shocking. But that's how it was. And so here he is, and they're dealing with that, and they write this, and they were saying, oh, you got to do the feasts and the new moons and the festivals and all this Jewish stuff. And Paul says, listen, listen, in verse 16 of chapter 2, so let no one judge you, Colossians, about food or in drink or regard to festivals and new moons or Sabbaths. And he says this about all the rituals, Passover, Sabbaths, all that stuff. Those things are shadows which are shadow of things to come, but the substance is Jesus. The whole Old Testament, all those beautiful festivals and feasts, Passover, uh, Feast of Tabernacles, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sabbaths, the washings, the coverings, all those symbolisms point to Jesus Christ. They're shadows, and the substance is Jesus. And even Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, in the greatest Bible study ever given, the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, he says, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to what? Fulfill them. I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. The Tanakh, well, you didn't put the writings in, but the you know, the first part, the Tanakh, okay, the first part. Also, guys, the, the law has the covenants. Last point, guys, the covenants, these promises. The covenant of the law. The law covenant is written on stone. You better be perfect. And if you break one, you go to hell. That's kind of harsh. That's the rules of the game, guys. Read the Bible. That's just it. The covenant of the law is there. If you didn't have the law, grace would look weird. No wonder we need grace and forgiveness and the new covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ. The law but it's still in effect. You have the everlasting covenant with the Jewish people. The Jewish people have an everlasting covenant with God. Well, why the Jews? Why can't us English have an everlasting covenant? Why can't us gringos, these white people, have an everlasting covenant with the Lord? Why can't the Mexicans? Why can't the Latinos? Why not the Asians? Why not this culture group? Well, you know why, guys? I'm sorry. Latinos had all their crud together, man. The English, we were doing good. God always picks the whacked out weak things. And he looked out over the, all the creation and he saw one man, Abraham. Actually, his name was Abram. Jewish tradition says he was an idol maker in Ur of the Chaldees. He had a wife. They were old, barren. And he says, that's who I want. Why did you choose him? Because they wasn't, and God says in the Torah, because you're nothing. You were nothing, but I did something through you because I could get all the credit. One of the greatest proofs that there is a God is that there is a Jew. 
One of the greatest proofs that there is a God who loves is that there is still a Jewish people in existence today. They should have been wiped out many times over, but God's always kept them. Fascinating. The English, my people, well, we had all our crud together. We were pagan. We were wearing kilts and painting ourselves blue, but we had some stuff going on. You know, Latinos, Aztecs, Incans, all those guys down there, you had it going. You guys had a full-on system of roads, f calendars, and chopping people's heads off on top of pyramids. That's awesome. <laughs> Amazing. Throwing it down, playing. Remember that basketball game where you're not allowed to use your hands on your body, and if you lose, you all die? It's amazing. <laughs> Fascinating. Asians, they built a wall. Good grief. You know, it's just like, it's amazing. Fascinating. But God said, that guy has nothing, and his wife can't get pregnant. I'm using them. And then God shows up in Genesis chapter 12, and he says, I will bless those who bless you. Get out of your land. I'm going to give you to a, to a new land. I'm going to make you a great people. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed through you and by you. And through you, the whole world would be blessed. Not just by you, but what comes from you. And that covenant, he says, over and over again in Genesis 15, 16, 17, all throughout the scriptures, he calls it an everlasting covenant. It never dies out. You're like, well, God's done with the Jewish people. No, he's not. He has made promises to them. Well, they got to get saved. They got to have, of course they do. But he still has them as his people. When it came time for Abraham to shake hands with God on this covenant, Abraham couldn't do it. He was too scared. God met Abraham. Abraham sat on the ground. God moved through the sacrifice. And he declared his faithfulness to keep the promise. The covenant that God has with the Jewish people is not based upon Abraham's faithfulness. If that was the case, the next chapter, he fails. It would have been over for the Jewish people and all of his descendants. But the covenant that God made with the Israel, the Jewish people, was based upon his faithfulness and not upon the Jewish people's faithfulness. Well, don't they need to get saved? Absolutely. That's a different covenant. But the covenant that he has with the Jewish people is everlasting. It's still in effect. And that's why they're blessed today. Praise the Lord. That's it. Well, I'm jealous. Well, that's cool. Though, because now read Romans 9, 10, 11, and through Jesus Christ, we're grafted in. Oh, thank God. Because I want in on that covenant. too. <laughs> and we're pulled in. He hasn't rejected his people, but we're brought in as a wild olive branch. It's also in the Old Testament, we see the Davidic covenant that the throne of David, the throne of the Messiah will never end. Well, it's so many chapters. It's so long. It's so difficult. But you know how you said in the Old Testament? Here's a quick little primer. Slow down. Slow down. But I got to get through it. No, you don't. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? Nowhere. I got to get it done in a year. No, you don't. I got I got a reading program. I got to get done with Isaiah in a week and a half. And if I don't, Jeremiah is messed up. <laughs> Slow down. Go at a comfortable pace. Take your time. Read. Read it. Just read it. Chew your food. Okay? Just slow down at times. Find the gold nuggets in the Old Testament. Study it. Find those golden veins in the Old Testament. Surveys are great. A lot of people, when they, oh, we're in the Old Testament, and then I, I have a lot of pastor friends that will say, oh, we're in the Old Testament. And they go, we're taking the whole book of Isaiah in one sitting. What? Are you got to be kidding me. Are you all, Isaiah in one sitting? It, was like, it would be like if you had, you know, a... Uh, a 70, have you ever been to the Big Texan in Amarillo? There's a restaurant called the Big Texan in Amarillo, Texas. I drive through it on my way to Kentucky with my wife's family. And they offer a 72-ounce steak. And if you eat it, it's free. Or really the whole meal. And they, but you got to do it in, in one hour. I've never done it. I'll die. I will go home to face Jesus. And, uh, which I, it was not a bad way to go, but 
my wife have, might have something to say about that. But, but the thing is, it's like when you st- – surveys are great. They're awesome. But it's like – And then you miss out on a lot of things. Have you ever seen those guys eat at those – the Nathan's hot dog? Oh, are they enjoying those hot dogs? No, they're not. Those guys are not thinking about, this is delicious. Oh, the bun ratio with my mustard is fantastic. It's scrumptious. No. They're like, hur, 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 and it's disgusting. <laughs> Surveys are good, but sometimes when you look at someone doing a survey, you're like, oh. And sometimes that's all people get, and they're going to miss on the wonderfulness of it. Slow down. Find the gold nuggets. There's blessing in the details. Be spirit-filled. Ask the Holy Spirit to come in and help you when, with the Old Testament. He's our helper, our teacher. Do it prayerfully. Pray in these things. Apply it to your life. Research. Ask questions. If you don't get a passage, you're like, what is Ezekiel saying? What is this in this passage? Sometimes when you hit some Isaiah passages, you're like, what was that about? Ask questions. Get the history. Do research. Google has a lot of good stuff on it. Be careful where you go. I remember one time I was doing this subject of angels in the Old Testament. And I found this great website. I was like, oh, this is great. And it was telling me all this stuff about angels. Wrote it all down. Taught it to my youth class. And I dad, my dad, who was the pastor of the church, he says, hey, what would you teach on this morning? I said, oh, angel, angelology in the Old Testament. Great job. I said, tell me about it. I started telling him all this stuff about angels. And he's like, where did you get that? I said, well, I found this great website. He goes, dude, that's Mormon. I'm like, what? He says, you just taught Mormon theology to the kids. I'm like, what? Yeah, angels have wings. You're saying the angels don't have wings? They have wings. Read Isaiah. He goes, well, oh. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Looked it up, and at the bottom it says, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Like, dang it. So be careful with the internet. That's your lesson for the night. If you don't get anything else, get that, okay? Be careful. Be careful. Look, check your resources. But guys, research. Ask questions. Look it up. And also, hey, if you need, that's what Justin's here for. Ask Justin. Well, what if Justin, he'll know. He'll know what to do. He's your pastor. Get a pastor. Get someone. Ask Justin. Call him up and say, hey, bro. I have a question for you. In Daniel, what does this mean? And you know what? He'll tell you. And he'll help you. That he, he's, he's your pastor. And also, get, get another pastor. There's some great resources out there. Great, great. My favorite, I'm old school. I like Pastor Chuck. If you listen to Pastor Chuck going through the whole Bible, simple. Simple. Blown. You'll be blown. If you have not done that, do it. I'm not going to, uh, you know, well, you're a Chuck worshiper. No, I'm a Jesus worshiper. But I am just really stoked with Pastor Chuck. He's my pastor, one of my pastors. And you study the Bible with Chuck, dude, it's just simple. But guys, what, I love the Old Testament. And I want you to love it too. Get into it. I, it's just an encouragement to you guys. Don't forsake it. Don't look at it as a daunting or too big or too hard or, or, or done or it's old. That's old. I want something more revel- relevant and cool. Oh, no, that's cool. It's the whole package deal, dude. It's the whole thing. Get into the Old Testament. Well, what about the New Testament? You never mentioned that? Oh, that too. Take the whole counsel of God's word. Devour it like a good burrito on the west side. It's just, <laughs> just do it. Some good stuff. Okay, guys? Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for your love and grace towards us. We ask, Lord, that we would be a voracious reader, voracious studiers, voracious lovers of your word. Lord, let us never forsake any part of your word. And Lord, we ask that we too would enjoy the word of God and enjoy the Old Testament. In Jesus' name, amen. Now remember, guys, remember one thing. Jesus' favorite book of the Bible was Deuteronomy. He quotes it more than any other book in the Bible. That's something, you know. What about Psalms? I would think Psalms would be his favorite. No, he quoted Deuteronomy the most. What did he use to fight temptation? In the, in the, what did he use? The, the word of God, but what part of the word of God? Deuteronomy. So cool. Beautiful, isn't it? Get in the word. Enjoy it all. Amen? Let's worship. All right.